Hey everybody, this is Garrett with Earth and Time, and today we're going to learn about the tragic 1812 event that took place in Southern California, specifically at Mission San Juan Capistrano, where 40 Ahashmen lost their lives and two bellboys or altar boys lost their lives as well with an earthquake that ended up collapsing the Great Stone Church there. So this is an event I knew nothing about until I toured the mission. So I'm going to take you with me, learn about the geology there, learn about the Ahashman people, and learn about this tragic event. Let's get to it. In 1812, there was a series of factors that came together to create a major tragedy in Southern California at San Juan Capistrano. Those three events that came together were one, nature, and that is the San Andreas Fault Zone, which is an active fault zone. Two, were the Spanish who came in and colonized this area and built these missions and three the Ahashman people who were the indigenous people of that area that the Spanish were converting and having helped build these churches and who were actually attending service in 1812 when a 7.5 earthquake hit which created a major tragedy for the Ahashman people and slowly started the demise and neglect of Mission San Juan Capistrano. I'm going to start this video by talking about the geology first and the environment that set up the ability for there to be such a large earthquake. A 7.5 magnitude earthquake is huge. It's something that would be life-changing if something like that struck in the LA area today. Earthquakes in Southern California are related to the San Andreas Fault Zone, or some people call them a fault line, which is a continental fault. In other words, it's a fault that bounds continents or plates. And in this case, it's the Pacific Plate off to the west. We all are familiar with the Pacific Ocean and the North American Plate off to the east. Now, what makes San Andreas Fault a little different than maybe other faults we've thought of or talked about in the past on this channel? is that it's called a transform or a strike slip fault. That means that the plates, instead of one dropping down relative to another or overriding one relative to another, a normal fault and a thrust fault or reverse fault respectively, a transform fault or strike slip fault is where plates actually slide past one another in a horizontal manner, which we can see here. The San Andreas Fault runs from the Gulf of California all the way up past San Francisco area into what's called the Mendocino Triple Junction and it extends about 750 miles through California proper and along this whole section it can be broken into three general regions a northern a central and a southern and the area we're most concerned with today talking about the San Juan Capistrano earthquake is really what's happening down in the southern portion of the San Andreas Fault in a large fault zone province, like along the San Andreas Fault, it's not just a single strand or a single fault or a single fault line that can create earthquakes and release energy for a magnitude 7.5 earthquake, but there's a series of smaller faults that exist all along and adjacent to the main fault strand. One of these fault strands, known as the San Jacinto Fault, intersects the San Andreas Fault really close to an area called Cajon Pass in Southern California, an area that, that many Southern Californians know very well from driving from LA or Southern California towards Las Vegas. That scientists believe it was a combination of an earthquake along the San Jacinto Fault Trace as well as on the San Andreas Fault interacting with one another that made it such a large earthquake in 1812 and allowed it to get to that 7.5 magnitude. Now a question to ask is how do they know that's what ruptured in 1812? They can see the evidence and at the time the missions were recording or keeping records of events that happened so they know the event happened but the question is how did they pinpoint where it happened? Well that's where modern science steps in in a number of different ways and what science did is looked at a number of different types of observations to help pinpoint where this could have happened. One of those was a science called dendrochronology and dendrochronology is the study of looking at tree rings to look for stress events. And so through that process scientists could look at rings 
for trees in the area that were alive in 1812. And they could see there's a stressor event specifically around that El Cajon Pass area. Scientists can also make models. So understanding how faults move through time through a series of models, experimenting and find out where would the focal area need to be to generate that large of an earthquake to do the kind of damage that was seen across Southern California. And with all those observations, there are a series of hypotheses or ideas based on observations where this could have taken place. One of the, the most popular right now is that it was a combination of an earthquake on the San Jacinto Fault and the San Andreas Fault, probably about where El Cajon Pass is at and where those faults intersect. And that could have drove this large of a magnitude of an earthquake. Now, the other idea could be it was just on the San Jacinto Fault or just on the San Andreas Fault as well. However, because of the size of this event, having these two faults interact based on modeling would help them achieve that 7.5 magnitude earthquake. So that covers the nature story. Now let's move on and talk more about the indigenous people here or the Ahashman and talk a little bit about their history. And I'm going to show some of the displays from inside the mission, which I really enjoyed that they had some of the displays there and I was able to learn a lot about these indigenous people. And what we can see here is a map of the Ahashman origins. Here's Mission San Juan Capistrano and you can see some of the other indigenous tribes that were in the area. So San Juan Capistrano is right here, right in the middle of the Ahashman territory. The Ahashman lived in small villages or seasonal camps where they'd have anywhere between 35 and 300 inhabitants. These camps would have been in the southern part of what is today Orange County and they would have been areas where working from the coast all the way to the foothills the Hoshman people could gather, could hunt, could collect, and would also most likely trade with the other indigenous populations in the region. The villages are primarily concentrated along what was known as the Lower San Juan Creek today. And this is very close to the area where San Juan Capistrano would eventually be built by the Spanish. So that's a little bit about the background, the Hoshman people, some of the images and some of the displays in the museum. Now let's talk about the incoming of the Spanish and the colonialization that took place with the Spanish Empire coming into the California region. Let's talk about Mission San Juan Capistrano and its history. In 1775, they erected a cross at the Hoshman village along San Juan Creek, which would later become the site for Mission San Juan Capistrano. However, those early Spanish colonists had to leave due to attacks down at Mission San Diego, where they were required to go down and support and help construction and the start of the mission in San Juan Capistrano or in San Juan wouldn't occur until 1776 when Father Sierra came into that area, approached the Hoshman people and ended up converting them through time and they helped build Mission San Juan Capistrano. Now, I do want to say from what I've read and what I understand, the Hoshman actually were, quote, is a crowd of painted and well-armed Ahashmans, some of whom put arrows in their bow strings as though they intended to kill the Spanish intruders. They surrounded Sierra's group. However, one of the translators told the Ahashman people if they attack now, just more violence would come from the Spanish military. And so the Ahashman decided to try to work for, for peace. Now, with the Spanish coming in with the mission, they also built a church. It was known as a Great Stone Church. And here's a little bit more about that Great Stone Church and actually what it looks like today and what it may have looked like in the past. Look inside the Mission Basilica, the modern church just right adjacent to Mission San Juan Capistrano. We can get an idea for the size and maybe even a little bit of the opulence of what one of these churches would have looked like on the inside. Now, this is more of a modern church. However, it really does give you an idea about what the Great Stone Church could have looked like. In fact, 
if you look at a picture of the basilica, it reminds me a lot of the same footprint as we saw with, with that original church. church was laid out in the shape of a cross which is a pretty common practice even today and it measured 180 feet long by 40 feet wide had 50 foot high walls included a an 120 foot bell tower which of course is the bell tower that would eventually collapse during the earthquake of 1812. On the tragic morning of December 8th 1812 during an early morning mass a 7.5 earthquake rocked the region, what and it was become known as a San Juan Capistrano earthquake. The 7.5 earthquake shook hard enough that it actually lodged or wedged the doors shut and the parishioners were not able to get out. And along with that intense shaking, the 120 foot bell tower collapsed. Now, 40 Ahashmen lost their lives in that earthquake and that collapse, as well as two altar boys who were ringing the bells in the bell tower as they collapsed down. So quite the tragic day for San Juan Capistrano and for the Hoshman community and for the families of those two boys. With this tragedy really marks the steady decline of San Juan Capistrano as a seat of power in this area. There were a series of other events that took place during this time. There was a series of floods before the 1812 earthquake. All of these events eventually led to individuals leaving the mission area as well as the slow uh, demise of it and the slow neglect that eventually once Mexico won its independence in 1821 and took over this area they ended up selling the mission off as a ranch to a family eventually it would get returned back to the Catholic Church by Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s Thank you all for joining me today to learn about the 1812 San Juan Capistrano earthquake. I hope you learned a lot. I know I sure did. I enjoy taking you all along with me to, to learn what I'm learning as I'm going through the mission, as I'm doing the research on these projects. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please leave comments down below. I love hearing from you all. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notification to keep up on all my new tours and all my new adventures. Thank you to each and every one of you and take care.